and welcome to another episode of Around the Verse. I'm Sandy Gardner. And I'm Sean Tracy. This week, we're back with another Squadron 42 special. We'll take a look at the all-important gameplay story animation team, but first, let's check in with Nick Elms over in the UK for this month's project update. Hi everybody, and welcome to April Squadron 42 update. The GFX team have made a variety of visual improvements to the glass shader, making it an altogether more versatile tool, suitable to as many assets as possible. A simple unlit mode has been added, allowing the glass to be used on visors and ship canopy interiors without distracting reflections and glare. The refraction effect has been improved with the enabling of glare and blurred refractions, allowing us to achieve effects like sandblasted or frosted glass, condensation, grease and fingerprints. Combining the refraction capabilities with the unlit mode is making it possible for us to create some convincing dynamic visual effects. We can now fog out the edges of the visor, for example, if you're out of breath. We can ramp up the glare if you're looking at the sun in a dirty or damaged helmet. We also improved the crack effect and synced it with the health entity so we can realistically smash UI screens. The VFX team have been working on the screen interference system that will feature heavily in many areas around the coil in S42. Although still in early R&D, we are adding more drama and situational reaction to the cockpit experience with these effects that add interference to onboard computers and readouts. Lots of things in space can mess with your instruments and the static storms pulsing through the coil aren't doing pilots any favours. As you can see, this adds an element of environmental storytelling to the rather limited view of the cockpit interior. And even simple effects like these add narrative tension as well as added challenge from a gameplay perspective. Staying with VFX, the contrail system has had additional focus this month. Details like the unique contrails seen when flying through the coil add more layers of detail and immersion to the environment. As we saw a few months back on ATV, the coil is almost a character itself. It's a really singular environment, and it takes a bunch of seemingly small components working together. Visuals, audio, special effects, and game mechanics to create what's coming together as a really compelling experience. It's important, while implementing all these design elements, that the area retains its disorientating, intimidating personality and represents a challenge for the player but remains fun and intuitive in terms of gameplay. As we saw on a different episode of ATV, the crew of the Idris frigate more than doubled in size from what was originally planned. We've had to make some design tweaks to accommodate the extra hands on deck, with a glaring need for additional officers' quarters. We've now added pilots' quarters linked to the main crew quarters on the Idris. As you can see, these digs are a considerable upgrade from the double bunks in the main room that we saw back in the vertical slice. They really help to make the Idris interiors feel like real, lived-in spaces. The gargantuan Shubin engineering facility is a great example of the really impressive levels and physical spaces in the game. You can see how the scale of it and the atmosphere, from lighting to layout, further carries the visual storytelling so important to the medium. A lot of Squadron 42's narrative is affected by and centred around the Shubin Mining Company. And as we were developing the story and looking at the level design, what started out as a relatively simple mining platform eventually morphed into the massive facility you see here. It even necessitated the inclusion of a monorail system as seen in last month's update to make getting around faster and more convenient. Another key location seen in the December livestream was the old Chemline facility, long out of commission. We're working on a new control room prop set for it, and these assets represent the brains behind the operation, so to speak. In their day, long before the events of Squadron take place, these systems were top of the line, with hardware and software working in perfect harmony to keep the operation running smoothly, efficiently, and most of all, safely. Time, as it does though, has moved on, and these once high-end systems are left dormant, gathering dust and slowly decaying. Safety might not be a word best associated with them now. We've been testing a prototype to allow players to manually inspect the FPS weapons that they are currently carrying. When in this new inspect state, the item is displayed centrally and can be rotated, allowing the player to view each side and any attachment ports. The focus has been on pistols, stocked and shouldered weapons, as each type of gun has very different requirements when it comes to animation poses and the fluid transitions between them as you can see in these examples of each style being tested. Building off the progress we saw in last month's update, work on the turrets for the massive Vandal Hunter ship continues. The 
The organic design, seen in all the Vandal weapons and ships, manages to be intimidating and beautifully fluid all at the same time. Equal parts deadly viper and blooming flower. The Vandal have a very distinct look and feel that we're trying to make consistent with everything from their large scale tech, like ships, to their turrets, and even their hand to hand weapons, armour and physical design. Everything about the Vandal is intense and visceral, and when players tangle with them in the game, it should feel markedly different than engaging with humans or other alien aggressors. That's all for this month's update. Thanks again for all the fantastic support, and we'll see you again soon with another S42 update. Thanks, Nick. As you've seen over these last few months, the story of Squadron 42 is told through various mediums within the game. Last month, we looked at the way AI can convey character and story information through combat and other forms of in-game interaction. We've also seen how cinematics utilize the game's all-star cast to create dramatic effect, but there are a lot of important interactions that drive the story separately from the tentpole sequences. That's where Gameplay Story Animation Team comes in. Let's take a look at what that team has been working on and just how it's factoring into the game in this month's feature. In Squadron 42, the story is, is quite vast and, and very deep. And to be able to handle this properly, we've actually taken um, the story itself and broke it into two different production teams. The first is cinematics, and they are primarily concerned with things such as uh, the through line of the story, the, the, the major plot points that take you from the beginning of the game through towards the end of the game. Squadron 42 is, is considerably deeper than just the, the main through points. Um, and we wanted to build a more uh, robust life, essentially, within every place that you're at in the world. And to be able to do that and to, to handle the production of that, uh, we've created a second team, the Gameplay Story Team. And this team is, is going to deal with things that may or may not be through line, but that add a greater depth and, and player experience to Squadron 42. Yeah, gameplay story is different to cinematics in that there's often uh, like a more interactive element. There might be an element of, uh, of player choice or, or something else, like uh, interacting with a, a cupboard door or something like that. Something that needs to happen in the world that means it's, it's got an interactive gameplay element. It's something in between where it has an element of storytelling and cinematics to it, but it also has elements of gameplay mechanics. In Squadron 42, the characters that you meet along the way that are on your battleship or in, in different locales, they all have their own lives and you can interact with them and they, they will respond back to you or, or have conversations with you depending upon who they are and, and what their relationship is with you. This allows us to add a, a greater depth to, to the, the experience of Squadron 42. You, you don't just feel like you are being pushed from plot element to plot element to plot element, but there, you're actually living within this world, you're living on that battleship. These are actually living, breathing people that you're interacting with within the, the, the Star Citizen and, and Squadron 42 universe. Part of gameplay story um, is absolutely critical to the main story, so you can't really make progress in the mission until you speak to the characters and get the information from them, uh, with them sort of telling you where to go and what to do next and stuff like that. But also there are other characters who are completely incidental that you can go and talk to and you can find out um, you know, how they're feeling or what they're working on or doing and there's a whole backstory to them that, to, just to make the whole world believable. So, Depending upon the choices that you make in Squadron 42, different people will have different reactions towards you and those, those reactions will change based upon the choices that you make. Um, and that gives, in, instead of them having the same response every time you come to them, or no matter what you do, it's, it's a canned response, they're actually responding to what you've done in the way that they would as a person in, in what their, their, uh, their likes and dislikes are and, and things like this. So they're reacting to you like real people instead of a, a, a typical um, AI. There's at least probably 250 gameplay story scenes uh, that I'm currently looking at 
um, and just trying to tackle those one at a time, really. Well, the first approach to the gameplay story was really just to get a handle on, on everything that had been recorded and, and how much we had to work with. The basic way we'd approach any gameplay story scene would be the same. The first thing we'd do was assemble all the assets, so the face animation, the body animation and the audio. We would take a look at the mocap that's been shot, uh, usually the quad video, uh, try and understand what the scene's all about, who's in the scene, what's the intention. So we'll work closely with design probably at the start when we're familiarising ourselves with the scene. So we'll talk over the scene with them, how they see it working, where it's going to fit in the world, etc. And then we'll go off and we'll try and we'll assemble all the animations, build the, build the scene, get it exported into the game, do a sort of first pass of it. And then we'll have to talk to design again and say, this is what we've got, can you get us, help us get it working properly. So the main tools we'd use for a gameplay story are uh, for the scene assembly, we'd start off working in Maya using the Red9 uh, scene manager, uh, building the face, body and audio assets together there. Uh, from there we'd export uh, to the game and then we'd probably use track view to do a previous pass on the scene so we can see it in the game quickly. Uh, then when we're getting a bit more in depth, we'd uh, go into Mannequin, set up our animations there with the correct tags and so forth. On the sub to get things working, we'd probably use Subsumption, which is an in-house tool, which is undergoing a lot of development work at the moment. And that's where all the magic happens really. And you touch the other more complicated parts of the game. So that's an interesting stage and one that we need a bit more design support for, but it's also where the animations really start to come to life and be interactive. So it's very cool. So we'll try and get things working in the game just in exactly the same way it's been shot, which is a great way of sort of revealing problems. And then I'll usually just try and solve them just one at a time. Okay, let's start with the biggest thing. What, what looks worst about this scene? Okay, let's fix that and let's move on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And so hopefully you're arguing about very, very sort of small details. And if there is anything that we don't currently have the tech for, then you're going to call that out and ask for help for other departments to bring them involved, get them involved and help you solve uh, something that maybe hasn't been solved in the game before. Our first step would be to get the face, body and audio animations working in-game. Uh, that's reasonably straightforward. Once we have that, well, we can see what's been captured in game. We can then decide how we're going to tackle the more complicated problems, sort of one at a time, really. Uh, so the first steps are easy enough. After that, it gets a little more complicated. The motion capture doesn't always match up perfectly. Um, sometimes a performance has been pieced together, two different takes of mocap. So quite often, some of the animation work we'll do will be to sort of blend over those little cuts in the mocap. Um, sometimes we need to capture a new idol to go in place for when the player's taking their time to make a choice. So we might even need to do some fresh mocap for that. Yeah, usually it, it takes a lot of work to get it from just the initial capture stage into something that's, that's fully working in game and every aspect and every branch working correctly. Another challenge that gameplay story needs to deal with is because we have these, these scenes that happen, they, they may have one, two, three, four or more characters playing all at once. Those characters are not playing through just a, a linear editor. Those characters, they, they, they have lives before the scene and they have lives after this scene. And the challenge with that team is to be able to um, work with the performance capture and create transitions and, and the technical uh, ins and outs for these scenes so that characters when they're running under AI code can make their way to the scene properly. We can, we can perform the, the experience and then they can exit to wherever it is that they need to go. So once we've got a gameplay story scene in game initially, we're then going to try and push that and get that to our final quality stage. So in doing so, we'll have a lot of different things to solve along the way. We might have to um, add the same sort of start and end poses to make sure animations work together, add an idle, maybe bring in some new mocap, maybe make sure the facial animations work incorrectly, add in any player choice, implement the scene branches, in a voice for the player, if there's a look at, uh, if the player needs to look at somebody or the character, need to add that in, uh, and then sometimes transitioning to and from an AI character as well. So there's a lot of different things you have to solve one at a time, and we just start with the biggest problem and solve that, move on to the next. And eventually, when you can't see more problems, then you know you're more or less done. I think a really important point within Squadron 42 and Star Citizen and, and overall in animation on this game is we try not to focus on the word AI, even though in the reality of it, it is a AI or it is AI code. Um, what we're trying to achieve 
is that this is a living, breathing world. It's a living, breathing universe. Um, and everybody who is in it has their own likes, their own dislikes. They have their own backstories. Even characters that you may fight against um, instead of treating them like just a random guy on the screen, that that person got there somehow and they have some sort of goal um, and that helps us to drive how those characters react, whether it is in a combat space or in a space like, like the gameplay story, um, adding uh, far more depth to, to the, the gameplay experience. Uh, I've worked in animation for a long time, so for me, animation is the light that, uh, you know, that lights up the game. It's the most important thing for me. So yeah, I'm really keen on animation. I think it's uh, if you if you look at something for the first time, the way it moves is probably the thing you'll see first. So I think it's yeah, it's hugely important. So I really enjoy working on the gameplay story, and I want to bring these scenes that have been captured into the game and bring that life into the ship, so that you're not just walking around uh, an empty spacecraft. That there's real people there with real stories and interesting things going on the whole time. So yeah, no two gameplay story scenes are really the same. We have a massive range from simple little quick one-liners that are said during combat up to full scenes and multiple characters, up to sort of 12 characters filling a room at a time with very dramatic things going on. Uh, and then we have everything in between. A lot of scenes will be just sort of two or three characters, you know, talking or doing or something or working on something. So, uh, you know, I'm still discovering as I go through uh, different aspects to gameplay story. So it's, uh, there's a lot of variety in there and it's very interesting. Thanks guys. As we've seen, with Squadron we're telling this huge story, but that story is taking place in the living, breathing universe. The gameplay story animation team's work is going to go a long way towards fleshing out the narrative and achieving the balance that makes it all feel believable. We'll have even more on Squadron 42's development next month. And you can still head to the Squadron 42 section of our website to sign up for our dedicated monthly newsletter which includes recaps of the updates and features seen here on ATV, as well as further insights about the game and info about special events and promotions as development continues. That's a lot of stuff. I know. <laughs> In Star Citizen news, the devs continue to fix bugs and make improvements to Alpha 3.1, testing and releasing patches regularly. Meanwhile, work continues on the features planned for 3.2. And some teams look ahead to future releases, continuing development on Hurston and its moons, among other content. You can always follow along with PU development via our public roadmap, always available on the RSI website. And we'll continue to bring you project updates here on ATV in the weeks to come. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if you or your friends still haven't had a chance to get into the PU, we have starter packages available to pledge for at a discounted rate. Check out our latest concept ship, the innovative and stylish 100i from Origin Jumpworks. And if Anvil Aerospace is a little more your style, there are still a few days left to grab an official Hornet t-shirt for 20% off the regular price. We're also teaming up once again with Intel to showcase Star Citizen through the power of the latest Optane and Core i9 technology. Over the next few weeks, we have screenshot contests going on with a chance to win an Intel Optane 900P solid state drive. So make sure you check Spectrum for all the details. In CitizenCon news, we're excited to announce that we will be celebrating with you on October 10th at the Long Center in Austin, Texas. For more details, including ticketing information, check out the official CitizenCon com link. You can access it via the handy link we provided in the video in the description below. Cool. It will be nice to have CitizenCon back in Austin where yeah. it all began. And that's all for us this week. Tune in to Reverse the Verse live on Twitch tomorrow for a monthly subscriber town hall episode where Steve Bender and myself will follow up on some of the things you saw in today's feature. And remember to check out this week's new episode of Bug Smashers and Calling All Devs. Thanks as always to our subscribers for sponsoring the shows. And thank you to all our backers for supporting the development of Squadron 42 and Star Citizen. Until next time, we will see you around, around the verse. The verse.
Thanks for watching. For the latest and greatest in Star Citizen Squadron 42, you can subscribe to our channel, or you can check out some of the other shows, and you can also head to our website at www.robertsspaceindustries.com. Thank you very much for watching.